Hello and welcome to the third video in our video series for the Singapore Linguistics Olympiad. Today's topic is phonetics and morphophonology. Just a quick recap. Do you still remember what a morpheme is? Test yourself. See how many morphemes there are in the following word, anti-disestablishmentarianism. If you found seven morphemes in that word, congratulations. Have you ever thought about what's smaller than a morpheme? One way to look at it is that each morpheme consists of sounds? But do any of these sounds make sense individually? For example, in the morpheme anti, what does a eh or n or t mean? Also, did anyone have the thought that writing a can be misleading? What sound am I referring to when I write the letter a? Is it a as in ash or cake or pass or a tree? These different vowel sounds, or any sounds in linguistics, are called phones. A phone is a sound in a language that is used together with other phones to create spoken meaning. Phones are represented in writing in square brackets. So for example, this phone on screen is O. This is where I would like to introduce the International Phonetic Alphabet. The International Phonetic Alphabet is a way to disambiguate when we're talking about sounds in language. So instead of saying, oh, it's read like the A in English ash, I can just write the AE digraph, which represents the sound A. Then for cake, I can write the E and the small capital I, and that represents A, which is actually a diphthong. It's two vowels that have come together and fill one space in a syllable. Then the funky looking E at the bottom right is called a schwa, and it makes the sound uh. Here is the full vowel chart for the International Phonetic Alphabet. As you can see, vowels are split along the dimensions of frontness and backness, and closeness and openness. As a very unacademic way of saying it, the location of each vowel is more or less where the vowel is being produced in the mouth. There are many intricacies, for example, which part of the tongue you are using to form the sound, what muscles are used, but in general, when we talk about a close back vowel, such as U, U, what we are saying is that this vowel is created at the back of the mouth. And here is the full consonant table of the International Phonetic Alphabet. This is just the main consonant table. There are some consonants which are pretty complicated and they have been separated from this table. On this table, going from left to right, on the left, we have sounds that are produced near the front of your mouth, at your lips, bilabial, two lips. Then, Going to the right, we have sounds which are made at the back of your mouth. For example, the velars made at your velum, and the uvulars made at your uvula, which is the thing that flaps around at the back of your mouth when you scream. And then it goes into your throat, which is where the glottal sounds are produced. Looking from top to bottom, we have different methods of articulation. As an example, a plosive sound is created when you temporarily stop the airflow coming from your lungs in order to create this sound, such as P. Here I would like to introduce the concept of the phoneme as a companion to the phone. A phoneme is an underlying sound in a language that can have multiple phonetic realizations, and phonemes are represented in slashes, for example, the phoneme O. What are phonetic realizations? They are different ways of saying the same phoneme. So the phoneme exists in the mind. The phone exists in the mouth. The link is made explicit in writing using the following format. You put phoneme in slashes, followed by an arrow, which means is realized as, followed by the specific phone in square brackets, 
and then another slash which means in the environment of. So, as an example, in English, the phoneme P is realized as the aspirated P in the environment where it is the first consonant in a stressed syllable. What is an aspirated P, you might ask? It just means that when you say this P, if you were to put your hand in front of your mouth, you would feel a very big puff of air. For example, pickle, apply. In comparison, in the environment after an S, P, the phoneme, is realized just as P. For example, special, aspect. In these words, you would not feel a big puff of air unless you really like saying special, aspect, which is okay too. A key thing to note is that different languages can have different phonemes because they're all in the mind. For example, in American English, the phoneme D is sometimes realized as the alveolar tap. For example, ladder becomes ladder, ladder. However, these sounds are completely separate in the American English speaking mind from the phoneme ev which is the voiced th sound, such as in the or there. In this case, lather, lather. Ladder and lather would be different words in American English. However, this might not be the case to a Spanish speaker, because in Spanish, the phoneme d is sometimes realized as ev. For example, cada, cada. And these sounds would be completely different from the phoneme alveolar tap. In this case, cara, cara. Now linking phonetics back to morphology. Morphemes undergo sound changes too. For example, the morpheme in, which I have put surrounded by two vertical slashes on either side. The morpheme in, meaning not, is realized as im, in the environment where it comes before a bilabial sound, such as B or P. For example, imperfect. It is realized as ing in the environment before a velar sound, for example, ingrate. And elsewhere, it is realized as in. For example, insufficient, infinite. That wraps up this short introduction to phonology and morphophonology. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you for sticking around. If you've stuck around for so long, let's take a short trip into a slightly different field of linguistics. Do you remember how we said the word anti-disestablishmentarianism has seven morphemes? Well, I want to zoom in on the base word, which is establish. Modern English establish comes from Old French. It comes from establis, which was a form of the verb establir in Old French, which means to build or establish, which in turn comes from Latin stabilio, to make stable, which comes from stabilis, stable, which comes from store, to stand, plus bilis, which is the equivalent of English able, for example, takeable, likeable. As an English speaker, if I were to look at the word establish, I would say there's only one morpheme, because I can't split it up into any more meaningful chunks. For example, I can't say estab means something and lish means something else. An old French speaker, however, might say there are two morphemes, because there is estable, which might mean stable, and ir, which is a very iconic old French verbal morpheme. 
a Latin speaker using the equivalent of this word might say, well, actually, there's three morphemes. It could be star, to stand, bil, able, and io, which is that verbal morpheme again. So how did this come to be? Well, from Latin to Old French, there is an inheritance of words going on. It is likely that stabilio was learned and slowly changed as Latin was evolving to French to, in the mind of the French speaker, become just two morphemes. Estable meaning stable and ear being the verb morpheme. In other words, there is no esta in Old French and bill. However, this is a bit complicated and I don't speak Old French. It's just a hypothesis. However, when English learned the word establish from Old French, this is a case of loaning. So English took the word wholesale from Old French without necessarily understanding the sort of deep morphological divisions. And therefore, we have the word establish, which is just a single morpheme on its own. So if you really, really want to, to if you really wanted to be pedantic about it, it is possible that this anti-disestablishmentarianism has more than seven morphemes. You could appeal to Latin to support your case, but I think for simplicity's sake, let's just keep it at seven morphemes. Once again, thank you for watching and see you next time.